So how do we make it faster? The execution of building that product and adding new features and making it better and how it best serves our customers. It's a constant thing we're talking about. Get faster, make it better, iterate, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, everybody. Welcome to From the Ground Up. I'm Zach Conway here with Kelsey McKenna. I think as people know, we're building seeds from the ground up. We talk about how to build businesses from the ground up. So we went ahead and named the podcast from the ground up. Kelsey, we've been talking a bunch about uh, at seeds, how to improve upon how we actually build our product. So how do we make it faster? Uh, You know, the execution of building that product and adding new features and making it better and how it best serves our customers. It's a constant thing we're talking about you know, make it, make it faster, make it better, iterate, et cetera, et cetera. But it got me and you talking about how does that apply to other types of businesses, including financial advisory businesses and how they think about bringing a quote unquote product to life. And I guess, you know, services at an advisory business are the product, right? What you're actually delivering to the customer products can sort of take many uh, forms And so that's what we want to talk about. How do you actually think about building a quote unquote product in your business and and what that, you know, how that translates into the services you provide? So where do we go from here? How how do we actually think about that and bring, you know, some of the conversations we've been having to, uh, to these advisors? Yeah. So I thought um, it would be helpful to talk a little bit about like what a product manager does at a startup, especially at a SaaS startup or at a a business where you really see what you deliver as a product and not as a service offering, because that's like a great place to just start thinking about this and reframing how we think. But I do think it could be very valuable because I I think even if you have a service-based business, what you're offering can still still be viewed as a product. And um, a lot of what you do and how you think about marketing and how you think about all these other elements of your business can also be seen through a similar lens. If we think of what we're selling as a product, as a whole. Um, So I brought a really short definition of what a product manager is. So a product manager is a leader responsible for guiding the development, launch, and growth of a product, ensuring it meets customer needs, aligns with business goals, and delivers value. So that's a very, very, very basic version. And I think we can stick pretty basic for this conversation to like the different ideas and mindsets and strategies that we think might be useful for advisors or for anyone building their business to be thinking about, especially early on. Um, but wanted to start there. So anything you want to add to that? Anything you want to change no, I or think highlight? I think that's right. I think there's, you know, it's like if you have sort of a services oriented business, it's like, well, I'm not building a product. I'm not a tech startup building this shiny technology platform or whatever. And and that's kind of the barrier we're trying to break here. Like what are the learnings and processes and mindsets and how you sort of, uh, you know, build a team around what how we're doing it within Seeds as a technology product platform or business how that actually translates, like what what you can take into a services business and and kind of orient services, quote unquote services, around this idea of product ideation to uh, you know execution and and how to iterate on a product moving forward. So that's the one, idea. Did you did you do? Oh, go ahead. Well, I wanted to say one thing too to highlight is that we are kind of in a unique position to talk about this. One because you come from a financial advisor, for, like a firm. So you yes. come from a service-based business and now are running a startup. And because we are not super academic product managers, there are people out there who are, they live and breathe product. And so this is really yeah. like a guide to, as someone who doesn't have an academic background or a long history of working in product, here are some of like those key elements that you can use without having someone who's dedicated to doing this. This is more like an entrepreneur's guide to <laughs> to some of this it's work. A- it's a good call out, right? This is just my perspective now after starting a startup, building a technology platform and now looking back, you know, even yeah. in our own business in the advisory business and how that reshapes how I think about how to improve the services within that advisory business through this sort of product lens. Did you write down a top 3? I think I kind of have a top 3 I ideas. Have three. Do you- 
Yeah, I okay. brought three. I don't know if I'd call them my top three, but I, I brought my three that I think would be most useful in terms of if I'm talking to um, an entrepreneurial for, um, uh, owner of a firm or maybe an advisor, like a lead advisor, or even someone on the operations side of an advisory firm who's trying to think through some of this to help support business growth, that sort of thing is really what I brought. All right. Give me your number three. So, all right, you're calling it most useful. What's your least useful of the of your uh-huh. of your three? Um, I don't know if I want to do it least useful first because similar to our last episode, like if they go in order, it makes a little more sense. So this Got may it. just okay. have to be a more random order. So they kind of go together. Um, so the one I want to say first is kind of a foundational piece, and we talk about this. It's not specific to product managers, but The best product managers I've worked with have this trait, and it's what we've really found the most success with in terms of our product iteration at Seeds. Um, So this is really a deep, deep customer obsession paired with the ability to gather and kind of synthesize insights from various Uh, resources or or various sources, I should say. So the reason that I want to call this out is we talk a lot about customer centricity. We talk a lot about customer obsession and and how do we really create a client experience that's amazing and all this stuff. And all of that is rooted in a deep understanding of the customer. But for a product manager to be really successful, in my opinion, uh, they need to also be able to gather insights from all of these various inputs and figure out how to prioritize and how to think about all of the different things that touch that offering, so that product offering, or in this case, the service offering. So the way I think that this could be applied um, is a lot of advisory firms that I've worked with, I think, have a little bit more of like a service mindset where it's a little bit more reactive and they don't always see some of the service elements that come along with their core um not it's not a core service their core like say it's it's the plan, right? That's their product in their mind. They're not seeing all of these other elements as part of the product that they offer. They see it as like the service side. So unifying those things to be able to get sources of feedback across all various areas of the business and have that help inform what you build, how you iterate, how you um, talk about everything, really everything that goes along with creating the offering. Yeah, that is an interesting uh, line that gets drawn between sort of uh, support Mm -hmm. and sort of relationship stuff in that category versus you know this is the service offering or this is the part the product i think for example you know in our business doing something like uh check-ins that are not quote unquote review meetings with a client to just literally check in and are there any current needs is any anything going on in their lives and anything we can help with whatever um you know the, the sort of courtesy call uh idea is that's in like the you know just white glove let's service these people well mm-hmm. category but really that is part of the the core product meaning what questions are should be asked in that quote unquote courtesy call and what information might you gather that then does inform the financial plan and then how would that be serviced in a next meeting and you know connecting those things together as opposed to sort of in your head having them be separate so the the thing on my list that's kind of closest to your point, so I'll go with that, is um, really being focused on feedback mm-hmm. in both your sales process and with current customers. So what can you learn in walking through the what your offering is and your value proposition in prospective client conversations, right? What, what should be shaping your service, therefore product, based on that? And obviously from current customers as well. And the one sort of like sub note on that I thought of is for us in seeds. And if you're a technology business, I would say the feedback can be arguably is, is really clear. Sometimes it's like, well, that feature is just not going to work. And and until you Mm -hmm. have this button and, and this piece of the technology and whatever, then I can't use the system as, as you're building it. Um, versus you've had a client for 10 years and there's an underlying unease. There, there's not necessarily explicit feedback about what isn't working. And the customer may not actually easily articulate what's not working. And so what that might mean is you really should spend time asking the question, 
right? It's one thing to do sort of, you know, like a super high level survey, you know, one to five, how satisfied are you with, with our services, but to actually do a deeper dive with some current clients and, and kind of pick apart. And by the way, they're willing to do this. If you, if you actually ask them and, and sit down and spend the time, you know, we've been, a, you've been a client for 10 years. Can we kind of, uh, you know, do a little discovery process with you and, and try to pick apart what's worked and what doesn't work and what you like about our certain meetings, what you don't like. I think that's really worth asking clients and really picking it apart. And again, obviously that's going to inform, hopefully should inform what you do from there. Yeah. I had one that I didn't list that's similar to that, but it's this idea of uh, like taking really specific tactics and and applying it to an advisory firm who's trying to kind of iterate upon what they offer. Um, so this idea of a product suggestion, I think, is something that is very much tied to like uh, a SaaS business or a technology product or something like that. Is that that's how you think of it? But one interesting thing, if you work in service for a SaaS product, a lot of product suggestions that you log are not actually suggestions that are given to you directly from the client. They're suggestions generated by the service team or the sales team or what have you based on um, other things that happen. So interactions that don't go as smoothly as possible, or I keep getting this question over and over again. And so I think we should add this feature. So that would just automatically answer the question or change this UI. So a lot of times I think there's a misconception as like the consumer of those products. You think product suggestions are like, oh, an, adv an advisor, like if you're us, an advisor typed to me and said, I want this feature. And I then sent it to the team. No, a lot of the best suggestions are actually insights that are gathered from various touch points across someone who's working with various customers who are using the product. So you can think of it in a similar way. And you can apply that same idea of what is our what is our log of suggestions? And some of those suggestions are not actually suggestions that ever came out of their mouth. They're just insights that created someone on the team to have a suggestion um, for something that you could do better. It's a really good point. Before you even may need to sit a client down and do do a deep discovery, the information may have been there all along. You just have mm -hmm. to distill it. You have to sort of, you know, take a step back and, OK, those what I call review meetings and how we frame them, something doesn't feel quite right. And we've heard these things somewhat consistently or see these issues, you know, the, the information may be right there in front of you. You just have to kind of, you know, absorb it and think about how to, uh, how to, what, what to do next and what to, what to shift. All right. What's your number two? The second one I'll bring. So this is one that I think gets overlooked even in like the product manager role itself. It, I don't think it's overlooked by product managers, but when people look at a product manager, they don't think of this part. But it's one of the biggest gaps that I see when I look at firms um, or when I work closely with firms and I understand what services they're providing to their customers. And then I look at their website or I look at their marketing materials. I notice this a lot. So this is that. So this is what we call it when looking at product within a, a larger organization or startup packaging. So a big part of the role of a product manager is connecting all of the dots between that ideal customer persona, all of the knowledge and insights that drove you to build the product in the way that you did, how you price the product and how you actually position the various services within that product. So we call it packaging. So I think that advisors could apply a packaging mindset uh, to what they already do. And just by just doing this alone, could see a big lift in how they convert, how they market, um, everything that they're doing, how they retain customers. So when you see a lot of advisors, they do do some form of this in the, in the sense of they tier. So there's usually in a lot of firms, I see a lot of tiering systems. So these are our bronze clients. These are our silver clients. These are our platinum clients, our gold clients, or what have you. Or maybe it's our customer A, B, C, and they don't call it that publicly, but they have some variation in what they're offering in terms of the product, if it's an investment product, if it's a planning product, like a deliverable, if it's a set of touch points that so they could be pivoting on that, um, how they price could vary across these different tiers. And that's the idea. But what I would encourage someone to do is think through everything that you do. So this goes back to what you were saying and what we were saying at the beginning about what else are you doing? What are those checking calls? What are those touch points? Um, your offering and how you package it doesn't have to only be the core like kernel thing of what you do as a business. It can include all of the other things and those things can be packaged up to directly hit the pain points of the customer persona that you're serving. So the goal with packaging is to say, this is one of our personas. We understand them very deeply. Here are their pain points. Here is the set 
of services, products, whatever you want to call them, that go along with that persona and pain point. This is how we craft them, put them together, and make it mean something upon seeing it. From there, you can test other things. So it might not be perfect at the beginning. You can test willingness to pay for pricing. You can test how do we market this to make sure it resonates? What other lead magnets should we put on our website that's for this persona that's going to drive them to this page? You can do all of that. But without that starting point of this is how this all fits together for this person to be very, very valuable, you're kind of missing the point. So I think I think it's taking that mindset and applying it to your existing tiering or your existing services or whatever you have already and thinking through which persona does this tier fit with and is it clear enough how the pain points are addressed by the various aspects of this package. That was essentially my uh, one of mine basically doing the zoom out right before you can try to iterate on the version of your product that exists today. And even before, you know, it's interesting. It's like you can, you you almost have to be careful to benchmark on feedback of a current customer base mm -hmm. if that's not the customer base that you're actually going to be focused on moving forward. And I think, you know, it's like you there are decisions that have to be made of, am I going to reshape, you know, the service offering based on the clients I've had for 10 plus years? And if not, then who are my new customers to all the points you just made? And I need to really decide those things and what their pain points are. That's the starting point before, but before I can build anything. And I, my, one of my other points on, on this is what I feel like I see a lot. And this is interesting because it's like advisors are, are on the right track with this idea of thinking about product. But what I see a lot is, oh, we just need to better digitize the experience we need to make it shinier and more sort of tech forward. Like that's the thing that's going to make the product work and resonate and, and make it digital, make it shinier, make, and, and like, there's not, it's not a negative thing by default, right? Maybe making, facilitating things like onboarding better through an app process, as opposed to a piece of paper. Like, of course there's value in that, but sometimes I see that that's happening, uh, and, and it's a little bit of a security blanket, right? It's it's not actually getting to some of the root issues of who is the customer you serve and how do your services really, really clearly align with that? And then how are those services specifically delivered and how all those dots get connected from intro meeting to onboarding to you've been a customer for two decades, all those little pieces, you know, having like a cooler app for how to how to type in balance sheet information or whatever is not the is not the thing that's not what you know the 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 next gen is seeking that's a piece of it right but it's what is the actual connected experience um so yeah that zoom yeah. out make those decisions first another thing that i see that i think is like if you if this if this sounds like you here's a little red flag that you may not be on the right track so the other thing i see is essentially what what a firm has done is they've created a couple tiers, like a couple packages, you could call them. And what they've done is they've just scaled up or down the amount of something based on what they are per based on basically how much in portfolio assets someone has. And right. that for me is a red flag because you may be, it may be working fine. Maybe you got lucky, but typically like just scaling up or down the amount of review meetings or the amount of touch points or the amount of times something is updated or the amount of whatever based on what you are equating to level of complexity based on a dollar value is not probably hitting the nail on the head. So when that is read, so what you have to do is think about who is this even intended for? Like, is this even a viable package at all? So, for example, if you have a segment of your clients who are under 500, you know, maybe it's under $500,000 in portfolio assets with you, and you're sitting there saying, well, the only way we could afford to keep these clients is if we reduce it to one review meeting a year and an email that offers a group session or something, right, for a Q&A. Maybe you're thinking that because you're thinking from your lens, how do I solve this? you may still be able to serve that client and you may still be able to have that be a profitable client for you. But that whole conversation will begin with how much would they pay 
for us to solve their pain points, which would then lead you to what are their pain points. There could be a totally different model that you're missing, a totally different way to monetize this or a totally different way to service this uh, demographic if there is consistency in their pain points and if there is consistent value that you can provide to address those pain points. So I think that some some folks just say, well, I charge 1%. Here's the calculation. I charge uh, my highest is 1%. So 1% on this amount is this amount. I need this many people. This is the package. That's not the way to go about it. It's really the opposite of like, who are these people? What are they <laughs> struggling with? And then is there anything viable, like business model wise viable that I can provide to them that would get them to continue to pay me and now we're packaging that and it shouldn't look like oh you just get more as you get more rich you get more that should not be the vibe that somebody gets or the impression somebody gets from reading your options on your website um so i just had to throw that in there because i see it so much but i think that's why you're missing that lower tier that's why you're not be and you're not able to connect with that lower tier and then grow them into the customers you want because you're approaching it from the, the inward out versus the outward in right are you matching core services and value to the pain points of the customers you've decided you're serving. Mm -hmm. And I like another way. So, so the tiering thing, like amount of wealth, amount of liquidity, let's say is just a component of that customer's profile and mm -hmm. what then would need to happen more or less around managing those assets but it, but to kind of illustrate this like if you if you just put two clients that both have 10 million dollars of liquidity next to each other one could be a 37 year old silicon valley tech entrepreneur that just you know liquidated some rsus that has a million question you know starting a family is going to go maybe start a startup is going to you know, whatever, all of the variables of that type of customer profile versus another client who is a CEO of a, you know, maybe a publicly traded company that's 67 and just retired and got his or her stock options, uh, you know, were, were vested and, and monetized and they need to figure out, you know, unwinding some of that stuff, but also, you know, what is their cash flow projection till they're a hundred and estate planning needs and a thousand different things. So if you're a business that's saying we serve both of those customer types, but your service offering is the same for both and how it's articulated and how you walk through the intro meeting to onboarding is the same, then the product is broken. The, because that it, it's not actually connecting, you know, connecting the dots between the customer and what you're delivering. Yeah. Uh, and so I have to give another example. I get so excited about this because there's so much opportunity here for people to be creative in this industry because there's so much repetition of the same stuff. But like so one example of this is is you typically see like services scale up so your higher tiers of of service it's like unlimited access or unlimited checking calls or something is like on your highest tier and then your lowest tier is like one annual review meeting or something like that or there's no plan it's just it's just managing assets or something right but what's interesting is if you play with this enough you may find that that unlimited ability to call even putting that there means nothing to that higher tier client. Whereas if you offered just that, if that was it, that was all that you offered to the lowest tier client, they would pay you a subscription on top of the AUM. Like yeah. there's ways, if you think about it, if you really understand who they are and what they need in the stage of life and in the, the wherever they are that's causing them to need a real human person, there are things that can almost be flipped on their head and say, well, this $10 million. He's literally off doing some other thing. He doesn't ever call us, you know, this, this ideal persona because he completely trusts us past the onboarding phase to do everything. And we are touching base quarterly or what have you. Whereas this person is a mess. This person financially is a disaster and they're not planning ahead a month, let alone a year. And so they need us to help them and they need us. And we can't even do a cash flow plan because they're such a mess. You know what I mean? So there are ways of flipping. It's not always like more just it's not always value stacking, I guess, is the point. It's crafting what that type of person needs. So I would try yeah. to get it right once and then you can go to your other personas. I wouldn't try to do everything all at once because you want to make sure you can actually deliver on the promise of the packaged product. But um, it's just another example of how it's not as simple as just scaling it up or scaling it down. You know what I mean? Um, there's a lot yeah, more to it often, than that. 
it's often like, okay, we do financial planning. We're really good at it. We know the tactics, you know, and that's the core offering. And so, yeah, we're just going to sort of pull a lever up or down of how much time and energy and effort and tactics we're going to reveal to you depending on your AUM size. And I think the the thing that is ironically overlooked is is just actually defining the customer again just to keep reiterating that core point and how the services are going to specifically match up to that customer and that is a whole meet them where they are you know there, there's a whole component of this of like then at introduction there's connectivity out of the gate as opposed to this over explanation of value where they the the value proposition is this sort of like amorphous broad idea of peace of mind and you don't know what you don't know yet about you know financial planning and issues that may be coming up for you versus what if they actually walked in the door for a specific need that could be built upon and they knew that you were uniquely capable of solving their unique needs um, but yeah. none of that, again, none of that can happen until these are the customers, these are their profiles, these are the services yeah. and product that matches that. And you don't need to like, it, it's also interesting, you don't need to be limited by the rigid view that you have today of who does what in your organization either, because there are major opportunities, I think, to be had where if there is that version of one of the products that you offer that requires a lot more handholding, but maybe doesn't have as much complexity or maybe it doesn't have as much like long-term planning, say this is the example we can use, there may be a junior advisor whose whole job is to get these folks organized. And you're essentially building an upgrade. You're, you're preparing someone for an upsell, which is the whole success side of this that advisors miss a lot. We could do a whole episode on like, what is client success in a SaaS or in a, a traditional startup versus how could those mindsets be applied to a firm? But it's the same idea. Those packages are delivering a promise and then you have to then execute, but it doesn't have to be within the rigid confines of what you've always done in your planning process and in your service model. There can be new and creative ways of selling all of the core competencies your team already has. Just different applications and and different ways of engaging with a client it's not just it's not just because you got a new tech product it's just because you re, you zoomed out and you got a little bit creative with how could we sell this thing that we already end up doing for these clients anyway like we already do it we have to do it to keep them and now we're just packaging it up and putting yeah. it on our website it's a good point the pieces may already be there mm-hmm. uh all right number three Number three. So uh, number three, I have as experiment and iterate. So this is one we've kind of touched on it a little bit here. But um, within most uh, startups nowadays, there is this idea of like an agile mindset, which sounds kind of scary. It's funny. Kitsies did a whole email on this, uh, like a whole Friday for advisors email on how could advisors adopt an agile mindset, which was a great piece um, that we could link to maybe in the comments. I'm sure it's on his blog. Um, But this idea of having a mindset that is really focused on flexibility, continuous improvement, collaboration, um, and this mindset of being not done. So a lot of times I talk about like the not doneness. So like <laughs> I'm not done. So anytime you're presenting something to a client or marketing something or building out your pricing and packaging or adding a new service or adding a new anything, deliverable, anything, this idea that this is not done. This is not a one time thing that we're doing. And once we do it, we're good for 20 years or 10 years or what have you. This is a never ending iterative process, which I think it's I understand why it's not very um, well adopted in in this space because there is a lot of complexity within these businesses. And a lot of these businesses are technically small to medium sized businesses with a ton of complexity and a ton of um, compliance and process and disjointed tech stacks. So I totally understand. But the mindset alone, I think, could go a long way of just not being done. What I think this mindset does the most for me is when I'm in a meeting with a client, I know that we're never done. Seeds isn't done. So if they don't like something, if they don't want something, if they don't agree with something, that not done mindset helps me understand that I have flexibility in how I respond to what they're saying and then what I do with that information after the fact. Um, So I think that's one of the biggest ways it can help. And it can also help with just mindset across the team flexibility and mindset across the team. There's a lot of rigidity, I think, in process in a lot of advisory firms where if the team can start to see it's okay to experiment, it's okay that we go out and we say, hey, we have this new offering and it fails. 
you know, that's okay. We don't need to map every single detail out forever into the future if we've never even pitched it to anybody, if we've never even gotten in front of a prospect who might be interested in it. We could just frame it up and say, here's a light way of how we would do this if somebody signed up with us, put it on the website, market it, go reach out to customers, say, hey, we have this new offering. Does anyone have any people in their network who would want this new offering? And then if anyone pops up, now we're like, oh, <laughs> like make it work. Like that's okay. As long as you're not breaking like any compliance rules or legal rules or anything like that, it's fine. Like it could fail and that's fine. So I think that mindset is just something that I would definitely encourage firms to try to start. Uh, if you're a leader of a firm, try to start doing it yourself, but also spreading across your team and looking for in your team. My last one is kind of like, what are the blockers that I think firms struggle with that block yeah. them from you know, being able to spend time and energy on that. And so I have kind of two, two pieces to it. One, I think is there's so much focus on business operations and internal efficiency, right? And so that's the lens that you look through to yeah. figure out what to work on. So like, how can we make a form, an internal form process better and faster? How can we aggregate data in a cleaner way behind the scenes? How can we, you know, structure the team so that communication flows uh, more appropriately? And this is not to say that all of those things aren't great and aren't unimportant, but it's like my point earlier about, you know, digitization is like the, the security blanket of feeling like you're improving your service and product. Working on all of that stuff, it's, you know, I'll go with my favorite, uh, phrase you know chicken <laughs> chicken and egg, or no actually this is cart before the ho horse not cart chicken the horse. Egg. yeah um cart before the horse why optimize around an operational process until you're a hundred percent certain the things that that is helping you deliver to the customer are actually right mm -hmm. and so it's just flipping that right i should be figuring out all the things we've touched on already of, I want to make sure that this service offering and how I layer it in across a relationship from intro meeting onward is actually continually iterating and aligning with our customers. And then I'll figure out how to operationalize that in the most, you know, uh, seamless, effective way. And so like, get out of the operational weeds, forget about data structure and, you know, internal communication stuff. Again, like it's critical, it's important, but start with the other stuff because that that will then be the support structure for for what you're trying to deliver to the client. And the, the part two to this is you need a process. And so we've kind of like touched on this um, and, you know, what does a product manager mean? But But you need a process to be able to iterate, to be able to have like a first pass of what this service offering is and to iterate on that. You need somebody in an organization that, as you as your your phrase is casting the vision, what are we actually trying to achieve? What does that mean to, you know, uh, sort of thematically what value we're delivering to our customers? What is sort of like our bigger picture vision? Um, somebody's got to be there to articulate articulate those big picture ideas. But then you need somebody who can translate that into a product framework like okay so that's great but let's clarify who are our customers what we need to actually start to build toward and then so you have that layer and then underneath that layer you have the execution and that's a continual feedback loop right so okay we've executed upon we need to execute upon these new we need to tweak this we need to tweak this we need to tweak this then we need to push it out there and then that product person and salespeople and for advisory firms, the advisors on the front lines are then continually providing the feedback we talked about earlier to that person who's running that sort of pro product plan. So you need those layers in place and how to communicate on an ongoing basis. So you need process and you need to be and you need to focus on the product as opposed to the in the weeds business operations stuff first. Yeah. And they do go together. They do feed each other. Um, and I think it does trip folks up. I think even so another little tip that will help with digesting this, because on the one hand, we're saying don't be afraid to throw something out there without having it buttoned up, but also have a vision that this is tied into and also 
have a process, but don't go too far into biz ops. So I understand that this is confusing, but one thing that can be really helpful is to just establish, I'm, we're not saying roll something out across your entire organization that isn't tested and isn't a for sure thing. So that's something key here. So when we talk about vision, vision should be big enough that the how you're going to get there could change and the vision is still the vision. So that's right. one thing that will help like just contextualize this. And then the actual like play and the idea of piloting and experimenting and iterating is typically not going to be across all of your advisors. If you have multiple advisors, it may be one advisor. It may be one point person on the service team or experiment or experience team who is piloting this if you're able to test it with a with a new client, right? It's not going to be rolled out to everybody. Once it's tested and you're experimenting, you're tweaking it, you feel good about it. Now we are officially trying to figure out, okay, how would we package this? How would we roll this out across other advisors and other team members? And that's where we start to get into like the really more tangible. We probably need a, a some sort of biz ops. We need a lens on this to make sure that we can actually deliver this over and over if we start to scale this up. But that's kind of in my mind how it fits together. It's not like we're saying, experiment, but cast a vision and do biz ops, be scalable, but don't be scalable. There has to be a, a little spot for innovation because it's never going to be optimized at the beginning. It's never going to be a for sure thing. That's the whole point of it. So whoever's doing it needs to know that it's okay if this fails. It's okay if this isn't exactly what we, we don't need to map out every single detail before we try it. You know, it's okay if we have to pivot, all of those things, as long as what we're trying and what we're, what we're aiming at is still aligned with the vision we are playing here. We are figuring it out and it can be very fun. And then we can figure out how to roll it out to everybody else and how to do all the other, all the other parts and pieces of this. It's a good point of, you know, I think it's like when we say these things, it doesn't mean be so overly prescriptive on every component of the service offering. And, and here's the language that's used in the, and you know, like really creating the tightest guardrails ever it's it's really just the foundational pieces, right? It's the all, all the things we keep saying. It's understanding who you're selling to, what the core services are that connect to those customers, where their pain is, and how you layer in those services across the user journey, right? And in how you're interacting with those people, um, and it, you know, and the opportunity to change and adapt and whatever is allowed by not spending you know a thousand hours writing the prescription in perfect detail for every aspect of all of those meetings and touch points but it's having the connective tissue throughout the you know that whole journey that's really needs to be clear yeah so, someone should do it before you're writing everything out i've noticed that too like we have this new offering but we haven't announced it yet because we don't have all of our reporting ready we don't have all of our meeting cadence ready we don't know and it's it's kind of for me that's a cart before the horse thing too is like if you're going to pilot something it should truly be a pilot not a okay we baked this for a year and now we're going to go talk right. to next gen you know what I mean? Right. It, it it can be a lot more lightweight than that, and it should be, or else you're going to waste valuable resources building something that has never seen the light of day, which is, again, part of the agile mindset of like, we are putting something out there knowing that we will change it, knowing that it's about to shift and change as it reaches the customers and as it gets out of these four walls that are our virtual business. Um, so, so yeah, it's definitely all tied together. All of this, as always in our episodes, is easier said than done. <laughs> but hopefully these are sort of, you know, inspirational jumping off points to start to think in this way. Uh, and, and before before I land the plane, uh, the it, it does make me think about, you know, seeds as a business and obviously us selling into advisory firms. Why this is a topic of conversation for us is we know conceptually how seeds can fit into the value proposition of an advisory firm. But a lot of times those firms that we're partnering with are figuring out some of these broader questions. And so, you know, it, it's part of kind of how we have those conversations and onboarding with firms about, okay, like here, here's how Seeds layers in, but we'd like to participate in the Zoom out with you because it's worth our time and energy to do that and make sure you have clarity there. So that's, you know, selfishly, seeds can be most successful in in how it fits into that, you know, part of your your service and how you talk about it and all of those things. 
So yeah, we don't want it just to be another provider that gets added on to the stack of whatever you're offering or whatever service you can get from us is just bolted on to some other thing that you've been working on for years and years and years. We we want to make sure we can come in and offer as much value as possible if that's something you're currently working on. Um, so that's definitely part of our success process is helping, you know, ta- we see a lot of different advisors. We see a lot of different types of setups and, and, and packaging and pricing and all this stuff. So it's definitely an area so we love to spend time on. It's a perfect segue. If you have not had that conversation with us to, and you want to learn more, walk through the process, come visit www.seedsinvestor.com. We'd love to talk to you and we'll see you next time.